The biggest hit was a ballad. That's the way I feel about you. Which <laughs> Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Bobby Womack, my story from 1944 to 2014. Okay, dig this, y'all. I'm still not feeling well. Um, you're going to be getting some audios. Uh, if you hear some snoring, it's Lulu. I knew I couldn't be around Sly much longer. And he wasn't the kind of guy you drop in on for half an hour and a cup of tea. The drugs had sheltered all my weaknesses. But I gradually started to break away from that scene and get my system clean. I got back into going to the studio, retreated into my music, and worked on getting a new album out. The more I cleaned up my diet, the stronger I got. It was a crazy story, but it wasn't one with a good ending. I was glad it was over and glad that whoever survived it survived. There weren't many. A few came out healthy or came out with their life or just came out. But a lot of people died or got hurt and some might be better off dead because they got so whacked out they didn't know who they were. A lot of casualties. The last time I heard from Sly, he had gotten himself straight. I was riding down Hollywood Boulevard, minding my business, looking straight ahead. I made a stop at a red light and glanced over and there was Sylvester Stewart sat in a Ferrari, staring over at me. I said, hey, Sly. He said, hello, put his foot on the gas, and drove off. Man, I thought as I watched his ride cruise off, what was that shiz about? All the stuff we had been through and everything. Next thing I knew, he backed up, leaned out the window, and said, hey, Bobby, sorry, man. I can't do that to you. How you doing, man? Then he said, call me. In 1970, Minute Records was absorbed into its parent group, Liberty, which closed a year later. Me and the rest of the roster were bumped over to United Artists. This was a breakthrough. I was given the freedom to produce my own work and brought out communication in 1971. It was a mix of covers. James Teller, Fire and Rain, Ray Stevens, Everything is Beautiful, a take on the Carpenters, They Long to Be Close to You, and some of my own tunes. The Carpenters version of Superstar. Long ago, and oh so far away, I fell in love with you. So their version was the awesome version next to the Luther Vandross version. The biggest hit was the ballad, That's the Way I Feel About You, which cracked the top 30 and reached number two on the R&B charts early in 1972. All the time this was going on, I was helping Sly out on There's a Riot Going On. I followed communication 
with Understanding in 1972, recorded in a few feverish days at American Sound Studio in Memphis and Muscle Shoals, Alabama. One of the key songs was I Can Understand It, but they didn't put that out as a single. What they did release from Understanding was A Woman Gotta Have It, which I co-wrote with Barbara's daughter, Linda. With Woman's Gotta Have It, I laid it out, said if you really want to call yourself a man, then you should treat a woman with respect. Treat her like you would your own mom. A few years later, a famous rapper came to me. Instead of singing Woman's Gotta Have It, he wanted me to sing Bitch Ain't Gotta Have Shit. I told him I couldn't do it. He said, Bobby, it'll put another 175000 in your pocket. Cash money. I said, man, I can't do it. First of all, my mom will have to be dead and gone, and she's very much alive. Then I really do believe if you got a woman and if you want a queen, you got to behave like a king. It's as simple as that. Also, I told him I couldn't go against what I'd sung in the 70s. We recorded Woman's Got a Habit at American Sound, and it became my first number one R&B hit, topping the charts in the spring of 1972. As the follow-up, United Artists released my cover of Neil Diamond's 1969 hit, Sweet Caroline, Good Times Never Seemed So Good. That did okay, but a lot of the black jocks played the flip side, Harry Hippie, the song about my brother, and that made number eight on the R&B charts early in 1973. Black exploitation movies were big in the early 1970s. Richard Roundtree was Shaft. I wanted UNA to give me a movie soundtrack to do. I'd got two successful albums under my belt, and for some reason, I wanted to write a film score. I thought I would be moving up with that. United Artists were reluctant, but eventually they conceded, told me they had the right film. It was called Across 110th Street, like in New York. Cross the street, and you're in Harlem, the ghetto, not far from the Apollo, where the Valentinos played with James Brown, perfect. That was my territory. I had come from a ghetto, so it was something I knew about. So pause right quick. Um, Y'all know I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, not just because he liked the, the uh, African-American Lotus Flowers, but because I think he is a genius director, writer, I, I, I. And the song 110th Street was also used in one of my Quentin Tarantino's favorite movies, Jackie Brown, with uh, Pam Greer, okay? He made that movie for Pam Greer, if you guys didn't know that. In 1974, I also had to face another tragedy, the death of my brother, Harry, the second youngest. We were born a year apart and were close probably the closest brother I had. He was also the Harry in my song, Harry Hippie. I never really did find out if he liked the song. Harry came to stay with me one Friday and was dead by the following Monday. Harry never got it. Why would I want to cut all those records? He knew what came with it. You get people on your case, you got to constantly come up and show them you still got it, he said. Who wants to be under that kind of pressure? I feel sorry for you. I see you with all those people. This person doing that for you, another doing this, but these people don't care about you. He was right about that. All I need is my sandals, my jacket, my little pouch, and some nice herb. So when Jim Ford, one of my writing partners, brought a song to me about a free spirit, I thought the story seemed to be about my brother. Jim hadn't written with Harry in mind, so I rewrote it, putting my brother into the story. I had started to make a bit of money, but got lost along the way. That meant I lost contact with all my brothers, including Harry. But one day in 1974, Harry called up. He told me he was having problems with his old lady. 
They were fighting like cats and dogs. He complained he was going crazy with it all. Pause. Oh, let me say something, okay? When I tell you that is a sudden thing for them men to call you the old lady, the first time the Texan called me his old lady, I wanted to smack him across the fucking face. How dare you call me an old lady? He was like, no, nah, I'm not calling you an old lady. You my old lady. What the hell? I'm like, I'm only in my, what was I? In my early 40s, something like that. He was like, you're taking it too personal, you know? Like, I don't know. I, I learned not to be offended by it, but it, it, you know, I equated it with somebody calling me their ball and chain, you know, but, you know, I don't know. That's a Southern thing. You know, I never heard anyone from the DMV use that term. So when he said it to me, I was like, what, nigga? Not the way your balls be touching the toilet water when you sit down. How you going to be calling me your old lady? How about you with them old balls? He said, I need to get out of here, Bobby. Why don't you come up to my house? Stay with me, I suggested. So Harry came to stay. I was living up in Hollywood Hills at a fire NZ place off Mulholland Drive. I could go back to looking after my little brother. It seemed like he had lost contact with the world. He stumbled around because he couldn't see too good. And he told me he needed glasses. I promised to fix him up with a pair. But then he started using smack, snorting, not shooting, and also selling a few bags on the side to make himself some sort of living. When I saw the state he was in, the clothes he was wearing, I couldn't believe how far the two of us had drifted apart. What made it worse, Seeing Harry down on his luck was, I felt bad about myself playing over what Sam had told me about not leaving my brothers. Thinking about when we used to sing together, me, Harry, Curtis, and Cecil, and what would have come of Harry if we had stuck together as the Valentinos. My girlfriend at the time, now she was a girl, the girl who put the voodoo on me. Part of this meant cutting pieces of my hair. I don't know why, maybe it was part of the ritual. She asked if I'd ever been to New Orleans. More hoodoo, voodoo. I told her I'd never go there with her. I was going bald with all the hair cutting. We were together five years. She was jealous. Man, that's right. She accused me of being with anyone. Harry couldn't get a fix on that. He thought with me living up in my big house with money, with cars, with whatever, that things would be cool. But my girl didn't seem to think so. One day he spilled out his thoughts. He said, man, I thought you'd be happy here and your girlfriend would be happy. You got everything. I'm living down there. I ain't got nothing. People were saying, look at your brother. Your brother has got this and that. What are you doing with your life? Harry, we both got our problems, Bobby. The only difference is yours are bigger. They get noticed a little more, and it costs a little more. He was in a bad space. It was like we knew his time was running out. He even said that he believed one of us was going to be killed, and he wanted to be him. I wanted to get him out in the world again and take his mind off his problems, so I gave him a car, and sorted those glasses, so he had no excuse about driving it. As he drove away from the house, he shouted out that he didn't want to go on his own. Do you want to ride? No, man, you've got to do this on your own. You've got to get back into the real world. He said, I know you love me, man. As he hit the gas pedal, I thought I could get him to come back and play bass with me. Get us working together again, just like in the Valentinos. Where shall I go? Anywhere, man. Just get lost. Anywhere you want to go. You're a free man now. A couple of hours later, I got a call. He was lost. Anybody, anybody.